Welcome back to the second Digital Services Act conference, uh, tackling the issue of the new rule book for the digital economy. I'm Dan Michaels. I'm Brussels bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal. And it will surprise nobody that for the Wall Street Journal, all things digital like this are, are real meat and potatoes, uh, very central to what we're covering. So I'm really excited and honored to be here. Uh, we now get into the discussion portion of the conference. This is session one. Our topic is online content. Is the updated liability regime fit for purpose? Well, before we get to the panel, I, I, about 20 years ago, in 1999, I had the opportunity to interview William Gibson, the science fiction author who coined the term cyberspace. And we were talking about this new thing called the internet. This was during the dot-com boom. And he said, what if it turns out there's no way to make money on the internet and it ends up only populated by rogues and outlaws? But we now know that it's possible to make unimaginable amounts of money on the internet, yet it's still populated by rogues and outlaws and also some law-abiding people. Well, today we're going to look at what the European Commission and the European institutions are trying to do to tackle uh, the rogues and outlaws and make things safe for everybody on the internet. Um, I'd like to welcome our panel now, um, and each of our panelists is going to make a brief introductory comment, and then we're going to open it up for a discussion. Um, and during that discussion period, viewers, uh, participants can toss in questions, um, and you know, feel free to pose questions for the whole panel, for individual members, uh, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. So to kick off our discussion, <clears throat> I'm going to pass the floor to Crystal um, from the European Parliament, member of the European Parliament, who is the rapporteur for the DSA initiative. So Crystal, over to you. Thank you very much, Dan, and also thank you for inviting me uh, to this conference. I think it is very important uh, to discuss uh, this proposal, the DSA proposal, and, and uh, I, I really appreciate the chance to do so with a lot of uh, knowledge speakers and, and guests. So thank you very much for that. Let me start by saying that I think uh, the DSA uh, proposal is one of the most important files in this uh, mandate for the European Parliament when it comes to uh, tackling the digital economy. I think it is important. It is a rule book. It is a basis for, for everything. Uh, I, I think it is important. And, and one of the things is that, I mean, I, we, we have a lot of good advantages by using the platforms, definitely. But I believe that the, the algorithms are challenging our democracy. And the big platforms are challenging our level playing field and online marketplaces are challenging our consumer protection standards on product safety. And therefore, uh, we need to do something. We have seen an increase in illegal activities around the Internet, uh, more illegal goods being sold, uh, problems with hate speech, uh, etc. So I think it is both timely and needed that the Commission has proposed the DSA. And in, in general, I think uh, the DSA, uh, the, the proposal from the Commission, is a good starting point. I'm pleased to see that the Commission has been taken uh, on board. A lot of the suggestions from the European Parliament, from the Saliba report, for instance, such as harmonising the notice and action mechanism, uh, the introduction of know your business customer, uh, and, and the fact that companies outside Europe uh, targeting uh, European consumers and businesses, of course, needs to comply with the rules and obligations. So far, uh, so good. Uh, I, I also maybe should mention that I also uh, like uh, the idea behind uh, the trusted flaggers, because I think that it is important that, uh, that we find ways for the platforms to work together with relevant authorities and organizations when it comes to identifying illegal uh, content. Uh, and, and also the transparency obligations uh, are, are important. However, and, and there is a however or a but, is it enough? And uh, that is what we're going to discuss in this session. And, and to be honest, I'm not sure that uh, this is enough or sufficient. Uh, I think that when it comes to liability, uh, I think that, that the fact that the co Commission more or less has suggested one size fits all, no matter whether you're having a, a, a social media platform uh, moderating uh, content or you are selling goods online, you have the same kind of uh, obligations and, and uh, the same liability regime. And I'm not sure that that is enough. Uh, from, from my point of view, uh, I believe that 
there is a risk, uh, especially when we're talking about online marketplaces, that uh, the liability regime is not simply not uh, good enough. We, uh, but but what is is good for the consumers might not be good when you are a citizen and wants to speak freely. So so maybe we should try to differentiate between the two kind of uh, services provided. And I know that the same platform can provide two or more services. But I think when it comes to online uh, marketplaces, I think we need to to look into how we can do uh, things a, a bit better than the Commission has proposed. Uh, I, I know that this is also something you're going to discuss later on in, in session two. But seeing from my perspective, I think we need to put or to consider giving the platforms more uh, uh, liability when it comes to the products sold uh, online. Uh, it can be done uh, in many ways. Uh, I haven't decided yet what I would suggest or propose, but I think we need to look into it. It could be um, enlarging the obligations around the know your business customer, or it could be considering giving uh, the online platforms a kind of an importer uh, responsibility. For me, it's important that we try to make it as uh, equal as possible. So what is uh, illegal offline needs to be legal online. So the rights and obligations you have offline for a shop, uh, uh, physically shop, needs to be the same uh, uh, online. And I know that you can't completely compare, but I think we should work into these uh, questions. Uh, and therefore, I think that, uh, that we have a good basis, but it is simply uh, not uh, enough. However, uh, when it comes to uh, moderating a content, uh, freedom of speech is important for me. And therefore, I think it is very important that we try to stick to the fact what is legal and that should be taken down. Uh, but there are, of course, also challenges coming around that because uh, in the EU, we see that the, the 27 member states, uh, to, to a certain extent, don't have the same definitions on what is legal and what is not. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, concerning hate speech, etc., we have different uh, legal uh, frameworks around uh, EU, and, and this is also something we have to look into. Uh, we have a principle of country of origin uh, in the proposal. I like that. That's taken from the e-commerce directive. But when you have this uh, right on uh, to t uh, the discussion about taking down illegal uh, content, it will also be a kind of a country of destination principle and we need to look into whether we have found the right balance here. So just uh, to, to wrap up, I'm in general uh, happy with the proposal from the Commission as a starting point, but I think we have to go a bit further in order to make the platforms uh, a bit more liable when it comes to uh, online marketplaces because here uh, we will see a lot, we already already today see a lot of illegal goods being sold in EU that compromises the, for the level playing field for companies, but also the high standards of consumer protection that we have in EU. When it comes to freedom of speech and, and harmful content, I'm very uh, cautious. Uh, I think that here the Commission has uh, found a better balance, even though we still have to look into some details of the proposal. Dan, back to you. Thank you for now. Thank you, Crystal. That's a great way to get us started on this, this issue, this balancing act that's going to be playing out over coming months, years, between uniformity, sweep, and specificity targets. I'm now going to turn to uh, Prabhat, who is going to give us the commission perspective. Prabhat is head of the unit for the digital services, uh, for digital services and platform at DG Connect. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, colleagues. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Schaldemose, for a uh, great introduction. And also, it's a pleasure to be here uh, because um, last year we were um, having this conf conference and we were still in the process of preparing uh, um, our proposal and, and carrying out a public consultation and working uh, um, alongside the parliament uh, who were also preparing their own initiative reports and, and consulting widely. And and the first uh, installation of the Forum Europe, Europe Conference on the Digital Services Act was, was one of the first main uh, um, major events where, where we covered, I re remember over several days, um, a, a whole range of issues that, uh, that we were discussing and we continue to discuss now. So I, I'm grateful to have the opportunity now to come back here um, with a, a great team and, uh, and, and, and great colleagues for this conversation online now that um, the Commission has... Uh, has made its proposals on the 15th of December. And, and, um, and I'm also pleased to see uh, um, today that we have a, a whole range of conversations around both the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act. 
which, as you know, uh, were, bo were both presented as a package together on the 15th of December, um, uh, because as uh, State Secretary said, Cedric O said this morning in his uh, um, keynote speech, um, uh, the two issues go hand in hand, uh, whether it is uh, um, the economic power uh, of uh, online platforms or whether it is the issues of content moderation that uh, we will be focusing on and the safeties of, of consumer uh, and, uh, um, and, and users uh, in, in the online world, including, as Michelle de Moses said correctly, um, the safety on online marketplaces. I really have uh, um, three main messages this morning for, for this introductory talk, and I'm very much looking forward to this debate in this format. Um, my first message is that um, I, I um, thanks to all of the work that um, uh, many of the stakeholders in the European Parliament have been doing, but also our own work, uh, at the European Commission. Um, I, I'm, I'm really uh, uh, pleased to say that, that this uh, proposal on the Digital Services Act is extremely carefully prepared. And we've, um, we've poured into the proposal um, really years of experience uh, um, with many of you, by the way, who are on this call and listening to uh, uh, us in this conference. And uh, we've uh, tried to have a very open, um, constructive dialogue with all parties and learn uh, from industry best practices. And just a couple of points that I just wanted to highlight on, on um, elements that have uh, built into the preparations. Of course, um, some of you may know that notice and action uh, procedures have been discussed in the, um, in the um, our illegal content removal procedure in, the broader, uh, in, in a broader sense have been discussed in the European Commission or in the European Union already for at least a decade. Uh, and um, there were consider internal considerations. I think it's no secret that uh, back in 2011, 2012 already, uh, um, there were reflections on a, um, on, on a, on a legislative proposals. In 2016, uh, 2017, uh, we issued um, a communication and then a, a recommendation. Member states, uh, notably Germany, uh, regulated around the same time issues of hate speech uh, online. And, uh, and, and we've really uh, learned from all of these experiences and, and uh, dialogues uh, and also as issues have evolved o over time. The other element that has really um, factored into our, um, into our proposal is uh, the really comprehensive commission-wide experience. It's really, an, um, you know, kind of in the UK, they say a whole of government approach. You know, here was a whole of commission approach where we have learned uh, from the various uh, um, self-regulatory initiatives, which have been extremely valuable uh, for us to understand exactly uh, um, the, the functioning and the details on the ground. Uh, be it on product safety and the product safety pledge or uh, counterfeit goods and the memorandum of understanding of counterfeit, uh, fighting counterfeit goods, uh, the code of conduct on the illegal hate speech or the code of practice on disinformation, just to name a few um, that have, uh, that, that have uh, provided enormous uh, input and exp ex expertise uh, um, without which we could not have uh, uh, made such a proposal. So uh, um, we've really... Uh, made an all-out effort to bring all of that learning into, uh, into the legislative uh, um, proposal. Uh, and, um, and, um, and, and this is the first message that I wanted to make. And, and of course, part of this preparation includes the extremely comprehensive uh, work that was carried out by the European Parliament, which frankly I have found impressive in many ways uh, um, uh, last year in, in the preparations of the many uh, own initiative uh, reports and and uh, and that we have uh, very carefully uh, um, carefully studied and analyzed in the preparations also of the commission's proposal. Um, the second uh, point that I want, wanted to make this morning in the introduction is that unlike other um, uh, uh, initiatives, be it in Europe or at national level or even outside of the European Union, I believe the Digital Services Act is really the most comprehensive. Uh, attempt um, at regulating uh, issues of content uh, moderation or illegal content, harmful content, but also um, not just individual items of, uh, um, of, of content, um, uh, but also the, the way that um, online platforms, and particularly the very large online platforms, uh, be it marketplaces or uh, be it social media platforms, uh, organize their services um, and uh, in, in the way that they uh, um, uh, use uh, recommender systems. Uh, um, recommender systems. Sorry, I'm just going to um, see if uh, this is better now in terms of uh, my microphone. Um, 
uh, uh, recommender systems or online advertising um, uh, uh, um, possibilities uh, um, are um, are are um, playing into the way that um, content is uh, is made available to end users or uh, um, the way that uh, um, certain types of uh, in information gets amplified and other types of information uh, gets deamplified. And this is uh, this is also moving away from an approach with individual listings on an online platform, individual pieces of, um, of content, be it on a marketplace, an unsafe toy, or be it a social media post, which might be illegal hate speech, uh, with which they can be um, which moving away uh, um, from, uh, um, from, from this approach for individual removal, either through administrative orders or user notices, and moving also to um, regulating the way that uh, um, platforms organize their systems and services. So this is my my uh, my second message was um, that we've really been very comprehensive uh, tackling an, an a really a, um, a very broad range of issues uh, that we um, that 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 we have identified and and we really wanted to it to be uh, uh, um, uh, the most comprehensive horizontal uh, instrument that that we could think of and 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 tackle all of the issues that that have been um, not only in the news but have been brought to us uh, as, as concerns uh, from, from, from various aspects. So this is my second message. My th third message is really, um, we're excited and, and ready um, to make this happen. Um, we have really uh, are um, very impressed uh, by, as I say, the work of the European Parliament, who have done an enormous amount of work in preparation for this, and, and, um, and also uh, very impressed by, by the um, uh, progress under the pr Portuguese presidency of the discussions at technical level uh, in in the council and and I'm I'm also encouraged by the three keynote speeches this morning uh, from the Netherlands from Poland and and from France um, showing the in incredible political support for 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 such a, a proposal so it, it might be long in terms of articles and it might be comprehensive in terms of issues that we have tackled but uh, I am really um, uh, uh, excited to see uh, this broad convergence around so many of the issues that we have put on the table. And of course, I fully take the point that that uh, um, some um, uh, may wish to see uh, um, some additional elements in it or or make adjustments to the Commission's proposals. Uh, this is, of course, com completely uh, the, 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 the right way of going about it. But just want to um, make here my commitment also working with stakeholders and and the co-legislators now um, to uh, to make this happen quickly and to to also to deliver on the Digital Services Act uh, um, in line with the expectations that citizens have uh, about this. My final point maybe is just to um, respond already now um, ahead of the discussion to a point raised by by Michel de Mose, um on on the on the issue of marketplaces. We have uh, inserted some provisions recognizing the specific elements. Of, uh, um, of 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 marketplaces, which uh, we fully agree uh, require perhaps um, some some dedicated uh, thinking, and and we've tried to put some in in place, either be it in the liability provisions in Article Five or in the Know Your Business Customer, but also uh, in some of the risk assessment articles that we have uh, for very large online platforms. Um, just maybe what I want to um, stress on those on the issue of marketplaces are two uh, two things. First of all, we fully agree that um, online marketplaces need to be safe for consumers and that consumers need to be protected from um, unsafe goods or non-compliant goods. And there needs to be a level playing field between those businesses that sell on mar online marketplaces and, and are, are, are taking all the necessary steps to ensure consumer safety and those who might not be doing the same thing. This is We, we fully agree with that objective and, and we're open to, um, to discussion on, on, on how to make that happen. Just one warning is that we see uh, um, uh, by watching the um, the uh, um, uh, evolution of online um, platforms and also with an eye to the um, development of the very innovative platforms that are uh, coming out of China, we see an increasing convergence between um, social media platforms and online marketplaces. Uh, um, and I don't mean the kind of classical um, uh, um, classical kind of two service approach like Facebook marketplaces or fo so Facebook social media, but I, 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 what I mean here is also um, the way that Instagram is now selling, um, also influencer marketing being on the rise, 
we've taken note of the recent um, acquisitions or partnerships between uh, um, social media companies and uh, e-commerce uh, um, providers, notably the last one in the news was, was TikTok. And so actually we believe that in the future um, that there will be um, much less distinction between social media platforms because which is ultimately where where, where attention is spent. And, and, and I, I frequently mention my teenage kids and I can guarantee that their attention is very much on social media platforms, but these are also places where increasingly they come across uh, goods and services uh, um, that they would like their parents to buy for them. Um, so, so this is just the, um, the, the final word on, on the marketplace ahead of the discussion. Um, just wanted to say that uh, this is a, a, an element we are very happy to discuss with everybody. That, but um, in, in the DSA proposal, we have tried to be f future proof and factor some of these developments in. And with that, sorry, I may have exceeded my speaking time, but back to you, Dan, and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Prabha. That was, that was great. You've given us a lot to talk about there. And I'm really interested in your first point. Um, the DSA, unlike a lot of commission initiatives that are entering new territory, the DSA builds on years of experience. I mean, the e-commerce directive going back to 2000. So you, you have experience with what works and, and probably even more important, what doesn't work. Um, and I think we'll also come back to your last point about this blurring of, of uh, social platforms and marketplaces, as you say, I mean, I have teenage kids and, and the world of influencers is fascinating. You know, are they social figures or are they pitch people? I mean, the, just the name influencer says a lot. So we're going to shift now from the people involved in shaping this legislation to the people who are going to be opining about it and offering their input over coming weeks and months. Our next speaker, um, Armin, um, is the head of division in the legal framework and digital services uh, at the German uh, Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy. So um, what is the German perspective, Armin? Yes, thank you very much, Dan. Um, I'd like to give you some insight into the uh, German government's preliminary uh, position on the DSA. Uh, Germany welcomes the DSA in principle. Uh, the legal framework, as you know, dates back to the uh, 2000. Uh, so the e-commerce directive has been the fundament for, for over the last 20 years. And it, it has been shown that you, you can have future-proof uh, directive in the EU, which uh, are effective for, for over 20 years in such an environment which is uh, developing very quickly. Uh, but we are also sure that uh, the, this framework has to be adapted to the new digital developments and competitive uh, landscape. So I will give you uh, some seven or eight uh, short introductory remarks and I must admit most of them follow the introduction by Christel Schaldemose. So firstly uh, I think from our point of view, it's important to establish a level playing field between service providers established in the EU and established those established outside uh, the e Union. Uh, we therefore support uh, the extension of the scope uh, of the DSA in Article 1, Para 3. Uh, traders and platforms which provide digital services within the EU internal a market should be subject to the provisions uh, of the DSA. Uh, secondly, uh, the principle of the conditional exemption from liability, which we know from the e-commerce directive, continues to be our guiding principle. Uh, however, uh, with a view to the platform economy, this principle should be complemented by incentives to take more responsibility especially as we heard from e-commerce platforms and, and marketplaces. Uh, we therefore welcome the clarification in Article 6 uh, that the mere fact that providers undertake voluntary own initiative investigations uh, does not lead to the result of losing the exemption from liability. Uh, however, the requirements of Article 6 are quite vague. Uh, for instance, how successful do voluntary measures have to be what voluntary actions would be considered as not undertaken in a diligent matter. The proposal lacks specification in this regard. Uh, this could lead to considerable 
legal uncertainty for authorities, users, and platforms. It should also be ensured that voluntary actions are undertaken in a manner that prevents and minimizes any possible negative effects for the rights of users. And Crystal Schaldum also mentioned that, especially their right to freedom uh, of expression. Uh, thirdly, we support the introduction of a notice and action mechanism uh, in the DSA, Article 14. Uh, as Robert mentioned, we have introduced such a notice and action mechanism in our German Network Enforcement uh, Act. Um, we have been asking the Commission for provisions for notice and takedown procedures on a European level for years, and Robert mentioned the, the history of this uh, provision. Uh, users should have an easy to access mechanism to notify illegal content. Uh, however, uh, we would like to consider different rules concerning reporting obligations and time limits to act against illegal content for small enterprises and large online platforms. Um, fourthly, we, we regret that the proposal does not differentiate between illegal information on the one hand, which is in itself illegal, for example, insult, and information that relates to illegal goods and services on the other hand. Um, and as, as Crystal Jalomose and, and, and Robert already re reacted, we advocate a clear distinction between interaction functions and transaction functions, which, and I agree with Robert, uh, sometimes are both offered by the same uh, platform but we have to reflect the different rights and values at stake. Article 22, the know your business customer uh, principle is a good example for this differentiation, differentiation between uh, transaction and interaction functions. Um, fifth point, it should be clarified, sectoral due diligence obligations for e-commerce platforms and online marketplaces and other platforms that can be used for transactional services are not excluded by the no general monitoring obligation uh, in Article uh, 7. Um, especially for large online platforms, it's not an undue burden to check user data with previous findings of illegal activity or to carry out automated searches for indications of illegal activity, possibly in cooperation with the Commission or the competent digital service coordinator on a national level. Uh, sixth point, as I mentioned, we support the know your business customer principle in Article 22 of the DSA. Uh, the traceability of traders is an important tool uh, to protect consumers on the one hand and to establish a level playing field between online platforms on the other hand. Uh, seventh point, um, all provisions of the DSA should ensure that small and medium-sized enterprises will not be subject to excessive obligations and unnecessary administrative burden. Large service providers and platforms or very large uh, platforms in contrast may be subject to stricter obligations. Um, my, my last point uh, is, is on the governance. Um, as regards illegal content and hate speech, we should reconsider the existing cooperation mechanism in the e-commerce directive in order to better protect online users. I think our experience, and we shared this experience with the Commission, has shown that the cooperation mechanism under the e-commerce directive does not work uh, sufficiently well. Uh, so we, we are in line with the Commission to to provide for an institutional setup which strengthens the cooperation of national supervisory authorities. Uh, this setup should ensure coherent and uniform control of the service providers by several national authorities within their relevant competences. Um, this is especially necessary as the scope of the DSA will be extended to providers established in third countries. Uh, we are still looking into the details of the Commission proposal considering the national digital services coordinators and the proposed powers of the Commission under the DSA. Uh, from a German perspective, the proposal poses 
special challenges for member states like Germany as a federal state. Uh, I'm happy to discuss these points in the second round. Back to you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Armin. That was very specific and concrete. You've given us lots to, to talk about when we open up for a discussion. I think, again, as you brought it up, this distinction or uh, lack of it increasingly between um, interaction and transaction, again, is just going to be a, a very rich vein um, for everyone. Um, our next speaker, um, Siada, is from DOT Europe. Over to you, Siada. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you for having me and allowing us to speak. So um, just for those who might not know, uh, DOT Europe is the trade association representing uh, many of the well-known internet companies across the EU, ranging in terms of services. And the DSA is one of our, our key interest uh, areas at the moment. We have been working on issues with regards to responsibility for coming up to three, three and a half years now, together with the members in a proactive manner. And so seeing the, the proposal from the commission is something we're very encouraged by. As um, Mr. O said this morning as well, it does give Europe a major opportunity to yet again be a trendsetter in terms of digital policy at a global level. And to that point, the DSA provides so much more than just a new liability regime. Um, it provides a full framework, a horizontal framework, in which uh, there will be more certainty on what, it, what content moderation means, how it needs to take effect, what responsibility actually means, and how that needs to be implemented. At the same time, because of the horizontal nature of the, of the piece, I think we run a risk that um, everybody would like to see everything in this piece of legislation. And I think that that's where, as ambitious as we would like to be as, as a bubble, as, as a community working on this piece, I think we will need to remain focused to, first of all, get it off the ground in a timely manner, and secondly, to actually allow it to be um, a, a useful piece of legislation, which we definitely stand behind. Um, but if we go into too many tangents, we will end up getting lost in the detail. And I think let's see it for what it is, a horizontal framework piece that will have verticals to fill in potentially more prescriptive gaps. Um, to that point, I think that that also brings in one of the questions that we had, how will it complement sectoral rules? And I think that that's going to be one of the complexities that we will all be dealing with, is how do we make sure that there's enough, enough definition in the DSA going forward to, that doesn't contradict any of the existing rules? And um, Dutch Europe has actually issued um, an online resource and mapping um, of some of the content moderation policies that are currently in place, either at the EU and the obligations that are currently in place, either at EU level or national lo level across the EU today, just to be able to see how complex this interweaving um, network of legislation is going to be going forward and how we make sure that there's coherence going forward. The other thing I want to bring up um, was with regards to the um, uh, fundament fundamental rights aspect. I think MEP Sheldamoza was talking about that as well. It's very encouraging to see that as opposed to the e-commerce dire directive that had no references to necessarily the fundamental rights per se, the DSA refers to that at various levels um, and in, in different occasions. And that, that lies at the core of where the DS, what the DSA is trying to, uh, to preserve as well, which is encouraging. Improvement of relationships with, uh, between service providers and, um, and the authorities is another thing that we're seeing shine through. And where the DSA actually excels is to recognize that there is a need for not just looking at the word of legislation, but seeing how there could be co-regulatory mechanisms that will deal with the practicalities of the day, and hopefully that will provide future-proof legislation going forward. 
I think that I'm uh, that I've covered most of the questions that I've been asked to uh, to uh, talk about. But I think that one thing that I would still like to mention: we think the proposal is extremely strong. It covers a lot of ground. There are, however, areas where we could all benefit from more definition. So, whereas I would very much advocate for preserving the horizontal nature of this piece of legislation. I think the definition, uh, the need for further definition comes in in specificities like, for example, on the criteria for a very large online platform, where you talk about users, what does that actually mean? Um, how are we going to define who the users are? Are they users in terms of account holders in the EU? Are they users in terms of um, eyeballs that can see the service what does that mean and just to be able to make sure that there is clarity as to where we're going on notice and action of course it's important to um, to create more user empowerment but at the same time the clarity on the process on what constitutes a valid notice is very important to the service providers the role of trusted flaggers is another thing that we have that we're going to be discussing that would be of key importance. And how do we prioritize what that means? Because trusted flaggers are going to have an advantageous position um, in terms of how their flags need to be treated. But what does that mean in terms of prioritization of different kinds of infringing content potentially? Does the trusted flagger always come in first? Is there going to be a vetting process for the trusted flaggers? And will they be evaluated on the work that they're being done? Will this be foreseen? as uh, as being a role for the co-regulator. So there still are questions to be answered, which I'm sure will keep us busy for the foreseeable future. Uh, but we're very encouraged in uh, the starting point that we have and very much thank the commission on the excellent job they've put so far. So Dan, over to you, and I'm happy to answer any questions that might come up. Thank you, Siada. Those seem like some, some wise watchwords there, but adding definitions, but at the same time, the too many tangents risk getting lost in the, in the details. Our final uh, introductory comment comes from Claire, who is the uh, executive, sorry, the yes, executive director of European Digital Rights here in Brussels. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for, for having me. I'm really pleased to be representing EDRI today, European Digital Rights. We are a network of 44 NGOs working in Europe and beyond to protect human rights in the digital age. So very much centered on, on human rights. Um, when I speak about the DSA, I'd like to remind you know, myself what is the problem that the DSA was, was uh, the problems that the DSA uh, is trying to address and in particular when it comes to online harms and hate speech. And one of the most inspiring story of resilience uh, of hate speech uh, for me is the one of Rokaya Diallo. Uh, for those who, who don't know her, uh, Rokaya is a black female um, journalist, an author and an activist in France. She's also a self-proclaimed geek who uses social media a lot. And as uh, many black women, uh, some of, of, of whom who don't have her level of exposure, she faces racist and sexist abuse every day. Uh, but what is really inspiring is the way she, she deals with it. She has uh, created a documentary about that one time she took her abuser who called her for rape uh, to court. She is still one of the most important figure in mainstream media in France on feminism and anti-racism. Uh, and uh, she's an inspiration really for a lot of women. She's also uh, a, a strong advocate against the French Avia law on hate speech. So, you know, why would a victim of hate speech like her be, be vocal on, on that law? Well, that's because Rokaya knows really well that, you know, content moderation can be a double-edged sword. Um, it, can, it can take away, uh, however good the attempts are, the same platforms and means that give her uh, the way as an activist to, to express herself. She also knows that the powerful can abuse their power and that it shouldn't be big tech deciding on the legality of her content, um, or it should be carefully addressed what kind of the risk governments can, 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 uh, can use and abuse. She, she also knows that um, what is uh, happening online is just a uh, an amplification. It's like a magnifying glass 
uh, of society and the society um, she lives in. And that magnifying glass is also the business model of, of online business. So what, what that story is, is telling me um, is, is core to the two messages that I'm bringing today on the DSA. The first one is that uh, where we are at the moment, the, the DSA really sits on the fence. Many speakers, including uh, Minister O, oh, have spoken of a balance. Uh, but for us, that balance is very fragile between maintaining uh, free speech and freedom of expression while combating harmful content. And we would need to see more guarantees to make sure that platforms cannot be pushed in making uh, rushed, poor decisions and that only judicial authorities can decide on what's illegal. The second point I'd like to make is that the DSA at the moment also seems to be even in conjunction with the DMA, a missed opportunity to really address one of the root causes of online harms, uh, namely the business model um, of, of, big, of big tech uh, based on online advertising and data exploitation. So on my first point, we are pleased to see that the DSA maintains the cornerstone of freedom of expression and the conditional um, immunity from liability, as well as the prohibition of general monitoring obligation. However, uh, as Fiara mentioned, the devil is in the detail. And we see that the DSA could open the possibility of liability if a platform receives uh, a substantiated uh, notice. Um, and for us, that would be a strong incentive for platforms to over remove or to just preemptively remove just in case it would be illegal. Um, and that could also lead to possible abuse by anybody, by users, by governments, especially in the cross border context uh, where the text is not too clear at the moment. And um, that, that triggering liability uh, could be a risk. What if, for instance, um, the Polish government, in an attempt to silence LGBTI activists, would re require that platform, all over, uh, like like Facebook, all over Europe, would uh, delete um, the the content and the image of the Virgin Mary with the rainbow flag, for instance, because it could be illegal and um, infringe on freedom of religion. For it. so this type of risk for us shows why EDRI will continue pushing and working with the European Parliament and the Council on making sure that only a valid uh, decision by a court can trigger liability. Uh, the second point on, on the, the business model and, and, and broader, um, we are really pleased, of course, about all the um, transparency requirements that are now included in regulation. Uh, we're really pleased about some of the procedural obligations and the um, groundbreaking, future-proof, next-generation level of obligation uh, on, on auditing and risk assessment. Where we um, uh, differ from like previous speakers is that we think this is just not enough. If we know that the, the way content is curated and amplified um, is meant to answering scale and virality and growth, um, we know that this is conducive to harmful content. And several of you have mentioned teenagers when diet related content is being pushed on, on uh, young uh, teenagers and especially girls, we know that this is very problematic. So what would we like to see um, is a progressive phasing out of behavioral advertising which is based on data exploitation. Actually, this call has been um, also uh, taken on board by the EDPS and by a growing coalition of MEPs. It won't be addressed in the DSA alone. We know that uh, we also need uh, the political will to enforce the GDPR and to have a strong version of the e-privacy directive, as well as red lines in the AR regulations. Um, we, we have also other recommendations when it comes to the recommender system, for example, and I can go into that in some of the questions, but that's to give you an idea that we think it, it would like to go uh, further on that. So to conclude, um, there are many aspects of the DSA and several of you have mentioned more, but on content specifically, um, we believe that the DSA is really mitigating some of the bigger risks uh, but not really addressing uh, the root causes of those symptoms. 
And we think that there are alternative possibles, um, some visions into which structural oppressions and other problems offline would also be receiving, receiving attention. And a vision where internet would move from being a shopping mall to being a public square, where people would thrive and human rights and the rule of law would be at the core of it. So thank you very much. I look forward to, to the questions. Thank you, Claire. <clears throat> Once again, you've brought us back to this issue, the tension between interaction and transaction. And you raised this issue of either an, an over um, excessive willingness to um, remove content or just the opposite, promote content that could be dangerous. So these are issues we can look into now. We're going to throw things open. We've got a few questions from um, our, our audience. I'm going to take my prerogative and, and start by asking one question, but I'd also like the panel to think if there's anything that any of you heard that you'd like to respond to or follow up on, please do that. But I'm going to ask my question first, and that is being a reporter, it's sort of my nature to seize on the latest news. We've had the, the capital riots in the US, which I think has been shown were fueled by online content of all sorts. Um, we've also had, <clears throat> excuse me, this recent fight in Australia between Facebook and the government over their new legislation, which comes by coincidence, just as uh, GDPR is in the process of being transposed into European national legislation. So, and, and, and in some ways is being shown, maybe some people have said not fit for purpose. What, what lessons can be drawn from these recent events for the, 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 the drafting, the finalization of, of the DSA and, and the issues that we've got on the table here today? Uh, any thoughts on that? Chriselle, please. Thank you very much, Dan. And, and, and first, uh, also thanks to all the good colleagues here. I think it was really interesting. And, and I have a couple of comments afterwards. But to your question, well, uh, what can we learn from the recent events? Uh, I think uh, what we can learn is that, uh, well, the Facebook Australia uh, issue, I think that is a question of the copyright directive that is being implemented at the moment. and and. Uh, Honestly, personally, I think it is extremely important that we have independent media and that they have a, a chance to, to, to earn money so that they can be there. Uh, but the copyright directive is exactly uh, going to touch upon that. And we will see member states trying to implement it. Uh, maybe they will be uh, too small to, 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 uh, to negotiate from a good point of view, uh, a starting point of view with Facebook. But, but I think that specific question should be tackled in the copyright. However, I think in general, and, and Claire did mention some about it, I think we also have to discuss the business, the, the fundamental business models of the platforms, uh, the advertising market. Is that fair enough? Uh, could we do something more? Uh, how we tackle it and where we tackle it, I'm not sure. Maybe in DSA, maybe not. But I think at least we need to use this opportunity to have a discussion. Let me say one thing more, and that is uh, on, on, uh, on uh, the riots. Um, I think what, seen from my perspective, I simply don't miss Trump's uh, uh, Twitter tweets uh, at all, at all. I don't miss him at all. But I do think that uh, since Twitter and other of the big platforms has become a public space, as Claire said, I think that we need to give the users some right, even when we don't like the content of what they're saying. Uh, so, so what I have learned here is that DSA should exactly give the users, the end users of the platform, some rights uh, that they need to, to know specifically when they will, uh, what, what are the, 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 the frame, when will they risk of being taken down from a platform. Uh, they need to be able to complain. Uh, they need to have some rights, uh, even Mr. Trump. But I like also the fact that, that Twitter, in the end, put up, uh, you know, send signal that uh, there are a lot of misinformation uh, in, in the tweets from, from uh, Mr. Trump. So I think that they, they tried, in the end, to act uh, as the public space they are. But I think uh, taking Mr. Trump down was, in my point of view, a wrong uh, decision, even though I don't miss him. But, but, uh, but here, it exactly, exactly this is some of the difficulties in, in the DSA uh, between, you know, the wish of the, the platforms, the very large platforms, has become public spaces. And, and how to tackle that? 
should we uh, give them more, uh, you know, uh, obligations to to moderate uh, and act, or shouldn't we? Uh, this is this is difficult, and I think we need to give the users some rights. We need to make that clear. We need to having more transparency in general. But I think when it comes to uh, moderate content and and con accounts, I think we need to be a little bit more cautious since they have become a, a, a public space. And then we can go go back to the uh, the the products and online marketplaces later on. Thanks. Okay. Any, yeah, Siada. Thanks, Dan. If I may, uh, I'd like to build actually on what MEP uh, Shalomos was just saying with regards to the Capitol Hill events. Whereas, uh, obviously, from our perspective we were in, in the EU, we're looking at it as a freedom of speech issue, but it demonstrates the complexity of content moderation because it's right at the core of it. This is a situation where in the US, there was a question mark on whether this was incitement to violence or not. Uh, incitement to violence being something that obviously uh, it should not be allowed on the platforms from a legal standpoint. Um, however, um, from a freedom of expression perspective here in the EU, where it might not be incitement to violence because it wasn't a call to rally the crowds here in the EU, it would be different. And that's exactly why the platforms have always said, we don't want to be judge and jury of what is allowed to be on the internet. That is not our ro role. To uh, Claire's point, that is the role of the judiciary. That is the law, uh, That that is the word of law that we need to follow. We need that legal uh, guidance as to what constitutes illegal content. And that's also why it's very important that this DSA um, starts by working on illegal content because that's where we have legal definitions. The one thing I did want to say, however, is to Claire's point, if I may, uh, very briefly, just to refer to her point about the diet issue, and I think it's an important one, especially when it comes to minors, that is obviously an issue that is going to be covered by the AVMS. And that's why I think we need to remember that the DSA is not operational in, uh, in isolation. It is together with all the other pieces of legislation that also are in place. So, for example, content with regards to, that could be harmful content with regards to um, diets, etc., that would be covered under AVMS. And so I think that that, again, dem demonstrates that we need to see what the role of this horizontal piece will be. And that's what I wanted to point out. Anybody? Yes, Robert. Yes. Um Thanks, Dan. It's a very interesting uh, conversation, and and just uh, on just wanted to say one thing. I mean, we've been we get this question about uh, the Trump delisting and the Capitol Hill events um, very very often, and uh, I mean, like anyone who's been working in this area, certainly me and my team, we've been playing, you know, playing a kind of a, a, a mind game and thinking what would have happened with the DSA in place, and 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 there are clearly things that that would have worked, and you know, up, upstream of of it as well. But just important thing to, just one correction that, um, not just framing issue that I'd like to bring in is that, the, you know, the issue that we are looking at more in the DSA is not necessarily about, from the perspective of somebody as famous as, as, as a president of a big nation who have access to lots of other channels, you know, journalists and mainstream media as well. It's more about uh, Mr. No one who has no rights, right? And uh, if he, if you, uh, if you know, if I get delisted, I mean, okay, now I work for the European Commission, so I can call Siada and, and get it fixed. <laughs> but uh, if, if somebody ordinary gets delisted or, or gets uh, um, gets removed or blocked, or, or even an ordinary business who gets their product removed from a marketplace, you know, it's those people that we have in mind. It's not necessarily heads of state of government who have enormous resources available, you know. And so it's nice to play this through and what would have been and what might have been. But it's really, um, you know, the, the and, and this is where I also want to thank Claire for making it real with the example of Miss Diallo, because there's another element there in that example, and I'm a big fan of the lady as well, uh, um, although I've never met her. But, uh, um, but what I wanted to just say is that there are many factors at place, and, and not all of them can be regulated in the Digital Services Act. There are lots of stuff in society that goes on, which needs to be solved in the society and not in regulation of platforms. And so this is, has to do with the root causes of racism. It has to do with the root causes. I mean, there's some horrible stuff going on on child sexual abuse material 
we can make sure that this material gets removed quickly or it doesn't spread. And, and, and we, you know the Commission has announced also another initiative on, on this material. But we're not, these, these initiatives will not ask the deeper question of why is this material out there in the first place, right? And, um, and, and so this is also what I want to say is that the DSA is a very important piece of law in many of these areas. But it needs to go hand in glove with other initiatives, and and th those are all of society initiatives and and all of government initiative um, that uh, that that tackle some of these other problems as well in in, in isolation. Um, that's a great point, Claire. You're next, and Prabhat. If next time, if you could hold your microphone, it was just a little hard to hear you. That would be great. Thanks, Claire. Yeah, just super quickly as a as a building on what Prabhat was saying. Uh, in the case of Trump, also you know we shouldn't we shouldn't forget like the platform he had as a as a head of state. He was making those same point offline uh, on the stage, you know, uh, the day before calling for for violence and so on. So uh, just you know plus oneing on on that. Um, but the 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 difference is of course when those offline. Uh, oppressions and tendency and issues are amplified for money on the internet and to 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 go back to your earlier point dan we are a lot of people and a lot of well actually a small number of very large platforms are making a lot of money on the internet exploiting those trends in society so that's the point that i want to make yes there are issues offline but it's kind of becoming problematic if those issues are magnified, amplified uh, because of, of, of profit. So we believe the issue lies precisely there then and that uh, other models of governance uh, on the internet are possible. Okay, well, I think what I will do now is read out some of the questions that we've gotten from uh, participants um, and then we can see who wants to, to grab them. Um, and to everybody watching, please forgive me if I mangle anybody's names. I'm, I'm playing a dual role here. I get to pretend that I'm the person in the audience who gets up and raises the question and then moderator. So the first one is from uh, Jorge Liz, I suppose, who's an expert at EESC. I agree entirely that illegal offline should be illegal online. Uh, which legal provisions or directives must be changed to get this objective or are codes of conduct sufficient? Next question is from Mike Isles, I suppose, director of the Alliance for Safe Online Pharmacy at EU. Given the mass amount, massive amount of business transactions, legal and illegal, do not go through online platforms. How can the scope of the DSA, how the DSA proposal be adequate in gaining across the board governance for criminals using the internet for illegal activity? For medicines, for example, the 35,000 websites selling medicines illegally are putting EU citizens' health at risk. Why does the DSA proposal not include all intermediaries? Uh, another one uh, from Irvet Templement um, in the Netherlands. I was wondering how we have to interpret the fact that Article 2.1G, the definition of illegal content, a reference to include the content not in compliance with the union law or law of member state. Shouldn't this be union law or law of the member state of origin? to make sure that the country of origin principle is not undercut. Um, and then one from Alex Fontaine, what is your view on one, broadening some of the obligations from larger platforms to smaller or medium ones, such as KYBC or risk assessment and due diligence as an obligation of means. And two, algorithm transparency to national regulators or request and not only in annual reports or to the commission. And then finally, from the same person that Court of Justice has recognized the possibility of a notice and um, takedown regime, could this be looked at by the Parliament and the Council um, with no general monitoring obligation, but targeting actions once a notification has been made and illegal content taken down? So um, those will be raised hands from the audience. Um, some pretty specific uh, questions there. Um, Armin, you... <clears throat> Put your hand up to respond, and then please, others, you know, feel free to jump in afterwards. Uh, perhaps on the on the question on what is illegal and what is not illegal, we have put this question to to Prabhat in the council working group as well, and I, I think uh, the answer uh, Prabhat's answer was, well, what is illegal is defined by EU law, for example, 
terrorist content uh, following the, the draft of terrorist content online uh, regulation and what is illegal in national law. So uh, I have understood that we are free as, for example, Germany to define what is illegal uh, under German law. And then the question, of course, is a country of origin principle, uh, who has to decide to, to take down this? And uh, so, so th this is the, the question of governance. Uh, and as, as you know, the discussion on the terrorist content online regulation was exactly on this point. Uh, who is in charge of uh, asking the platform to put down the, the content? Um, and so I think the answer is what is illegal is defined by EU law or national law. And the second question is how, how does the governance work uh, to, to execute this in, in all member states or in the member state concerned? Thank you. Sounds a bit reminiscent of the states around right to be forgotten. Um, but also to Claire, a point you raised about Poland and the, the images of the Virgin Mary. What if it's decided by a Polish court, uh, the way the Polish court might side with the government these days? So that drawing these lines gets a little uh, a little blurry. Siada, you uh, have a They rest. actually haven't, oh, yeah, uh, sure. just to say. <laughs> Um, no, the point I wanted to raise is maybe, for example, in Article 2G, not, not to start referencing all, all the articles, but just uh, for those who would like to look at the text, um, there is a reference to illegal activity there. And then um, the question is, are we talking about the activity itself, the behavior being illegal, or, for example, a video of that behavior? So if you have a video of somebody's bag being, being stolen in the background, and that video is posted on one of the online platforms. Is that piece of content showing illegal, is, is that uh, promoting illegal activity? It, would that fall under uh, the definition of Article 2G or, um, or not? Or are we referring just to that activity of the bag being snatched? Those kinds of definitions I think we need to still clarify. Uh, but the base premise of what is illegal offline is illegal online. I don't think uh, we, we would at least not counter that in, in any manner. We agree with that. Uh, but I just think in terms of definition, there's still work to be done. Uh, along those lines, we have another question from the audience which we can feed in. Uh, um, and that is directed to Crystal, but it could be for anyone. What is the definition of public space referred to, uh, referred to the platforms? Well, I, I, I saw that question and I, and I do think it is a good question, but it could, for instance, be the definition of a very large uh, online platform. Uh, in the proposal, there is this definition uh, based on, on users. I think, is it 45 million uh, users or something like that? Uh, I can't remember the, the exact number, but the same definition as a very large platform could also be a definition of when you do have a public uh, space. Uh, but but for me, I, I think it is important to say that this cannot stand alone. And, and therefore, I think looking into the DSA and the DMA as a package uh, is also important because what we need is to make sure that we have a real competition. And, and I would be happy to see more platforms coming up uh, so uh, you have choices as a user. So if you don't like uh, the environment in, in one uh, or you're, you're taken down or something, uh, uh, you can maybe go to another platform. Uh, I think we need, we need uh, to be, uh, you know, for me, it would be very good if we got more platforms uh, rather than having a few very, very large ones that decides everything. Uh, and because I think that's not good for anyone. Of course, it's, it's nice for, for the user sometimes to have, you know, just one place. But I think it's not good for the competition. It's, got no, it's not good for the freedom of, of speeches. And it's definitely not good for, for uh, the, the uh, marketplaces in general. So uh, the definition could be uh, very, uh, the same as the very large uh, online platforms, in my point of view. Anyone else want to take any of the other questions? We, um, I mean, this, uh, Crystal. Oh, sorry, Claire. Um, yeah, I, I would like to take the one on algorithm transparency um, and, and going back to that to that point. Um, I think the 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 fact to have uh, more requirements when it comes to transparency of of the recommender system and transparency of algorithm in general is a very good point. We are glad that they are 
there is harmonization there. Um, but, uh, and, you know, you need to know what is going on in, in order to, you know, compare it, research and, and, and continue um, advocating against this. But um, that's clearly not enough because we know that this recommender system is, is more conducive to harmful content, as I mentioned uh, earlier on. So what we would like to see, for instance, is a place where by default, those recommender um, systems are not based on uh, personal data and, and data profiling, but where uh, users could choose in and opt in to define, you know, the criteria that could be used for it. So for example, you know, if you like sports or if you like um, some, you know, whatever you want to see, uh, but that it's more of an opt-in system rather than having to opt out. So this is just one area for, for, for instance, where we think that the text is not going uh, far enough when it comes to, um, to algorithm. Thanks. Um, a couple of those audience questions were fairly specific about the drafting of the DSA. So I'm going to put Prabhat on the spot to um, address, I think there was the one about there were codes of conduct sufficient and illegal um, uh, or some intermediaries. So Prabhat, please feel free to take whichever ones you think are relevant. Yes, thanks. Dan, uh, I mean, uh, it's, um, it's great. Uh, the questions are, are show that, you know, if people are, are referencing individual letters in, a, in, a, in, a, in an article, you know, then we, we are in, in good set territory because that means that we are, we're, we're talking about details. But I, I don't want to, I, I just want to um, just step out, uh, step back for a couple of things also that some of the colleagues have said on the panel and, and just also recall that on some of the issues that, uh, that were raised, for example, by, by Claire on on um, on liability following a notice um, and and also the this, the role of marketplaces um, so on, you know they, the we have also been guided in the drafting of the DSA by 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 case law you know in in uh, in many cases, um, for example notice based liability has been recognized already by the court since the eBay case uh, and and also eBay case in 2011 also um, introduced notions such as active and passive that, that have kind of colored also freedom of expression debates uh, um, on, on, uh, on, on platforms. So even in 2011, um, the, the boundary between marketplaces um, and, 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 and other aspects of, of, um, uh, of, of, of platforms operations were we're not so clear cut and and i think that this is also in in response to one of the questions uh, in the chat it the court recognized um order and stay down but not notice and stay down so so just uh, some of these details are, are for the for the geeks of intermediary liability but it's uh it's 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 very important to see that that some the courts have given us some guidance uh on some of these balancing acts that we are doing and these have been factored in into the into the into the DSA. That's one point I, I, I wanted to make. Um, and you know, of course, we didn't just stupidly copy them, or and, and, and but we evaluated whether these are are, are still relevant to uh, um, uh, um, to the ca cases at hand. Uh, this is the one um, the one key point that I wanted to make. The other point on liability that I wanted to make is they also for marketplaces, for example. Um, you know, the court also has kind of ruled in some cases. For example, in the Amazon Koti case. That, that marketplace, that, that liability can be attributed even without any reference to an e-commerce directive or the DSA kind of liability exemption. So, I mean, those concepts are back, going back to Roman times, you know, when, when we you know who can, who can be. And I remember as a child going to the restaurant in, in I grew up in Germany and in every restaurant in Germany, there is a kind of liability disclaimer above the coat hangers, you know. This restaurant will not um, be liable if somebody steals your stuff, you know. So uh, it's, um, and I've always wondered, you know, um, of, uh, of, of, of this uh, thing. So uh, the point about the liability exemptions is to give businesses certain certainty that, that there is not a case-by-case -case, uh, situation for every uh, of the gazillion pieces of, of content that they're intermediating, that they have a different situation that they might be facing. This is the harmonizing effect. And either it's different because of each piece of content or because of different national rules. This is the whole logic behind it. So I just wanted to come back to some of those basics. And, and sorry if I'm if I'm pulling it up to um to the, this uh, at this level, but I think that those principles are still good. Um, but I think we need to complement them now with powerful tools to help user safety, um, consumer protection, and. Pre
procedural um, safeguards that, that, that reflect the responsibility of these actors. I think this is really what we're doing. And this is in the area where we are very open to discussions and, 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 and to uh, and share our, our views and, 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 and where, where we uh, think. But in, frankly, from a very high level of, of um, the Commission's perspective, you know, I feel we are kind of 80, 90 percent there. Um, and I understand that there are some areas where, uh, um, where, where uh, you know, co some of the colleagues would like to go further, and we're very open to discussions uh, in in this area. But I think that, you know, I'm I want to end on an optimistic note. I think that, you know, this train is moving at a fast speed, and I I think that's really encouraging, also for citizens. You know, and and and, you know, I, I always end with this anecdote: is that my kids. I mean, particularly my 14-year-old, you know, she rolls her eyes with her ki with her other friends saying, you know, my dad, my dad is kind of regulating TikTok. He doesn't even have any idea what TikTok is, you know. But um, but uh, when I explain some of the stuff that we're doing, you know, on recommenders, you know, he says, you know, I mean, okay, a teenager will never say it's cool what, what I'm doing. But, you know, she says, uh, you know, secretly that it's not so bad. So I think we're heading in the right direction here. And, and I think um, let's just, uh, let's work together to make it, to make it happen. I think this is my, this is just my plea. 14 year olds will be voting soon enough. So, yeah. Uh, Crystal, you wanted to say something? Uh, first of all, uh, I, I can recognize what Prabhat is saying here about my kids. Uh, they, they think it's rather cool that we are trying to, to kind of take back control from, from the platforms and, and, and make them uh, more uh, responsible for what they're doing. Uh, but the reason why I took the floor is, is, is twofold. First, uh, Prabhat, you said that uh, you think that the commission's proposal is, is at 90. Eight percent there, um, eighty-nine. Sorry, 89. No, 80, 80, 80. 80. Okay, this is the first time ever I heard that the commission uh, doesn't think that we should just take everything uh, without making changes. So thank you very much for that, Prabhat. So we have a room for for maneuver here, and I like that. Well, just sorry to be a, try to be a bit funny. Well, the reason why I took the floor was to to, uh, to talk about the algorithms because what I think is that. We need to, I mean, I think uh, working with the algorithms uh, are important. We need to differentiate. Illegal content needs to uh, be taken down. And the definition of illegal content, that must be, of course, both EU law and national law. That's how it is. And how we do it, that we have to discuss. But I think that that's how it is. But how about uh, harmful content? Uh, and here I think we need uh, to look into the algorithms because we need more transparency. With more transparency, it's easy to see uh, and, and maybe... Uh, uh, act against the fact that some of the platforms might uh, uh, maybe unintended maybe not uh, uh, want to 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 give more uh, room for uh, more extreme uh, points of views i think uh, so so uh, transparency around algorithms could help us uh, in certain areas of, of harmful uh, content i suppose and also the fact that i think we need to to uh, make sure that uh, the, the citizens uh, also are getting you know more digital literacy, uh, also being more uh, critical, learning how to tackle it. I, I, we're talking about the kids and young people here. They they might be more critical than we think. They they, they also know and, and realize that everything is not uh, legitimate. But still, we're not there and we need to do more uh, in order to, to help uh, people understand how to, to react. So I'm just saying that on harmful content, I think algorithms is, is one of the solutions and learning people uh, uh, how to, to, to use uh, the social media platforms is, is another one. It's not, uh, you know, uh, it doesn't end here, but that could be some of the answers uh, to, to tackle some of the questions around harmful content. Thanks. Great. Uh, Siada, and we just have about five minutes left, so please everyone think if you have any last comments. So Siada, over to you. I'll keep it very brief, um, but I did want to respond to the uh, algorithmic transparency point because as uh, industry, we're not against algorithmic transparency per se, but what we would like to see is smart transparency in the sense that who uh, are we providing what information to, to which end? So for example, if we're talking about uh, teenagers, we have got, a lot of the services have got dashboards already to explain what kind of, uh, how, how behavioral advertising is working, how um, certain bits of information are provided to them, etc. And we already have obligations both in terms of the consumer omnibus, um, in terms of explainability of how the algorithm works and on the ranking system for business users as well. So it, it's both a case of looking how it will be coherent with the other pieces that are already, of legislation that are already in place. 
and which audience needs access to what kind of information and under which conditions. Because if it's going to be very close to trade secrets and proprietary information, then obviously that cannot be public knowledge that has to be with either a regulator or um, a, an expert group under certain conditions that protects the trade secrets of the companies. So I just wanted to provide that nuance there that I hope that those are considerations that will be taken into account as well. Thank you. Um, any other final comments, observations from the panel? Okay, well, we are just about at time, so I'd like to thank everyone for all your really fascinating, you know, varied inputs from the sort of inside the room to the authoritative onlooker. Um, it's going to be a, a really interesting several, many months watching this unfold, uh, watching these sausage being made, um, and I'm sure we'll hear some of these same debates and discussions again and you've given me a lot to report on and i'm going to continue following this and uh, look forward to following the rest of the conference so thank you on behalf um, of myself and everybody and um, on with the rest of the conference thanks thank you thank you